evening, guys. How's everybody doing? What's up? Man, a whole bunch is going on right now. Uh, here in Ben Salem, it's been raining very heavily. They said it was going to. We're getting the remnants of Nate. But God's been just incredible. Uh, Ricky and I got to spend a little bit of time together this morning. He just left a few minutes ago for work. Please keep him in your prayers. Uh, not just with the weather, but the goofballs that are out there. He's a delivery driver for Papa John's. He was in the tennis industry for 35 years. Um, thanks to a drunk driver, he can't do that anymore. Uh, he's. We're also asking for prayer. I can't go into great detail, but he's considering... Uh, something uh, about when he reaches 62, because he'll be 62 this December. So we really seek your prayers on, on this particular decision work he's thinking of making. Aside from that, uh, God really spoke to me in a major way this morning through uh, the devotions, because as I was reading about Gideon, I was comparing them in a sense... He, him, excuse me, with Nehemiah, and I saw some uh, mostly differences, but I, I did see a similarity or two. Ultimately, Gideon decides to trust God, but I, I saw some contrasts in how Gideon felt the need to test God, to Ask God for a sign. And I think it was more than likely because his confidence, his faith in the Lord was so shaken because of what the Midianites had done. I think he was buying into the general sentiment that we're doomed. You know, I'm no good. You know, and I want to go into that a little bit. Gideon responded, you know, was acting out of fear. I mean, if you look in this passage, you're going to see at least a moment. You, if, I encourage you guys to read chapter six in particular, because this is where God calls Gideon. And in particular, if you read, if you read verses 11 on, you'll see this first moment when he's being called. When this angel of the Lord comes to him and says, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor, Gideon's like, what in the world are you talking about? He says, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where and where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about saying, did the Lord bring us up from Egypt? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. You see, he was swallowing the pessimism that was going on. He was swallowing, I think, a lot of the lies. I don't know how else to describe it. And then it's, it says here, that the Lord continues speaking to him. He says, go in this might of yours and you shall, save the is you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And here's an excuse that, and, and it was kind of a semi-legit excuse. But here, it was a lot like Moses with Moses making multiple excuses. But here, Gideon makes a bit of an excuse. He says, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. He's citing a few things here. First off, he says his clan is the least in Manasseh. He was from the tribe of Manasseh, but apparently his standing with his clan was low on the totem pole. And he said, even in my family, I'm low on the totem pole. So what in the world are you doing with me? But you see a contrast here where, where you have Gideon responding this way out of fear and unbelief. You see Nehemiah responding just the opposite. If you read in Nehemiah chapter 1 in particular, he comes before the Lord and he's beseeching the Lord on behalf of his people. You see him say, openly admit the sins of the nation. And he, and he, and he makes himself, he 
he includes himself in this. When he finds out, when Nehemiah finds out the plight of his people, the first thing he does is he immediately goes before the Lord. He humbles himself before the Lord and confesses his sins as an individual, the sins of his family, the sins of, of, of his people. And he comes before the Lord and, and chooses to seek the Lord in penitence and confession and asking the Lord for help as to how to deal with this. And from what I read in this, Nehemiah spent four months praying over this. And Nehemiah responded out of complete faith and obedience, if you see in chapter two. But I want to show, share something even more here when it comes to Gideon. You see, I think Gideon's response wasn't simply just a lack of faith. It was definite fear. I mean, you're living in fear because you're you're right in uh, enemy enemy controlled territory. I mean, look what happened. Seriously, the Midianites had said that they were they swarmed in like locusts and they took everything, food, you name it. They impoverished Israel. But then later on, you see a moment where. If you read further, you see a moment where Gideon gets some brass ones. If you read in particular, after he has this encounter with the angel of the Lord, he responds in another way of fear. He's like, oh, great, I'm going to die. I just saw God. And the angel of the Lord says, peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. And Gideon's response was he builds this altar to the Lord out of reverence. And he calls it, the Lord is peace. Now, that same night, the Lord appears to Gideon and says, I want you to take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has. So Gideon did it. He took 10 men with him. If you read this from verses, from verses 25 on, from verse 25 to 34, you'll see what I'm talking about. Mainly in particular, I should say, you read it from verse 25 to 32. Because they were worshiping Baal. And Baal was a fertility god. So that they've walked, at, walked off, walked away from God and they're worshiping these false idols. As, and now... Gideon gets some brass ones and he tears down this altar and his dad is, is, according to this, he's going to kill him. But he doesn't. Because in the end it says here, he refers to Gideon now as Jerubbabel, saying, let Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. And at that moment, he gets some brass ones. But if you go further on, Gideon has a talk with God. He, and he asks God for a sign. Now, this is a very interesting moment where he's, he's doing this. He says, listen, he says, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. And if there is dew on the fleece only and it is dry on the ground, on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so when he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it be now dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground, let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. Now, it's very interesting. You see Gideon, and, and Gideon's acting out of fear, as I said before. And the contrast is that with Nehemiah, the moment fear came into him, he immediately turned to the Lord. When he's before the king doing his duties as cupbearer, he immediately asks God for help. He says, Lord, help me. Give me the words. I don't know what to say. Give me the words. So immediately God gives him the words. And he says to the king, this is what I need. I need to be able to go to my people to be able to start building this wall. And these are the things I'm going to need. And he names all of it. Apparently, 
I believe, and even Pastor Greg was saying yesterday, that Nehemiah had probably been thinking a lot of this out and God had given him this. And it went into something saying about how there is a time to pray and a time to move, a time to take initiative. And here, Nehemiah was a leader who was willing to take initiative and risks for God's glory. Gideon wasn't quite that, but ultimately he was. He had to have this test. And I can understand why. Because he grew up more than likely hearing all these things, but he's seen just the opposite. He He's hearing all about God, but he's seen just the opposite because of the Midianites. And, and I can understand it. You know, as I, as I said before, when I was comparing both of these men, I saw interesting differences, but also similarities. How Nehemiah faces fear through praying to God. Gideon, Gideon's response is to let fear consume him, but he needs God to prod him on. He needs God to encourage him. And sometimes we need some, we need the Lord to encourage us. We need the Lord to send somebody to encourage us. We're going through something. Maybe God's asking us to do something that either we don't want to do or we're too scared to do. And we need somebody to come alongside us and say, get your button gear. You can do this. I'll be here for you. Because sometimes we get individuals that are as, um, as uh, Pastor Greg was saying, we get the Debbie Downers. We get those depressing individuals. They're, they're critical, they're pessimistic, and it's all gloom and doom. And the problem is they don't, especially that there are people who are saved and love the Lord, but the problem is all they see is the doom and the gloom. That's not how it works. And I'm going to go into that at another time. But here at this moment, you know, also if you see this devotional from Pastor Joe, Pastor Joe talks about how fear is the enemy of faith. This verse that's here, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's something very important, don't you think? I think so. God God didn't give us that spirit of fear. He gave us that a spirit, as it says, a spirit of, of, of but of power, love, and a sound mind. And he goes on to say, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Paul here is encouraging Timothy, don't be afraid to proclaim the word in season and out. And that's why I asked this question. Are you somebody who lives by faith? Or do you allow doubt and un unbelief to permeate you, to, to infest you and cause you to... To not trust God, or, or or do you struggle? Or you know, do you do you struggle with it, or 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 is, or is it both? I think ultimately with Gideon, he learned to trust God. If you read chap, if you, if you read chapter seven and eight, you're going to see what I'm talking about. God wanted to prove to Gideon that that he was going to use Gideon, and one of the ways he did it was, he says, "I want this battle when you go to battle against the Midianites. I want this to be a battle in which." I'm given the credit, not you guys. So he wind, he whittles down the amount of people. It goes down to, I think, about 300 men from about uh, in, in the high five digits. Read the passage and you'll see what I'm talking about. I think sometimes when we face fear, we act either one of two ways. Either we let it paralyze us and cause us to do and say things that dishonor God. or we go to the Lord and cry out to him and say, Lord, help me. I'm facing this fear. Please help me. And when we do that and we choose to face the fear with God at our side, we overcome whatever it is in God, with God helping us. You know, just as both Gideon and Nehemiah, they had their doubts and fears and everything. We have the same thing. We have a choice to make as to whether or not we follow God. You know, pastor was saying in this, it's so easy to die for Christ, but it's so hard to live for him. Isn't it true? I find it really hard in that area. I find it hard. But I know that 
when I choose to put God first in my life, it's something that I don't regret. I don't know how else to put it. And I hope and pray that as you're listening to this, I really hope and pray that you're taking taking this really to heart. I don't know how else to put it. Because where Gideon ultimately needed God's priding, and he finally trusted God, and he listened to God, and God just stirred him up, Nehemiah responded in faith and obedience. He didn't need to be prodded. I look at this moment when he goes before the king, and I want to read it. When he says here, so I prayed to the God of heaven. This is where he's like, Lord, give me the words, help me. And then he says, if it pleases the king, if your ser- and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And he goes on to say, as I said before, and as I said, he was willing to act on what God was doing for him. Uh, or God was calling him to do, excuse me. He was willing to take risks. He was willing to take initiative. He was willing to not just pray, but when God told him to move, he moved. Before I close this, I kind of want to share share this little, little, little joke with you. There was a massive hurricane in this town. And... This man was seeing the floodwaters coming through, bad weather, the whole nine yards. He sees a big, huge SUV coming by his home. And the guy's telling him inside, come in here, come into our car. You you need to get out of this. And the guy's like, that's okay. I'm waiting for the Lord to deliver me. Well, this time the water is now up to the door of the house. And he's on the first floor window of his home. And a boat comes by. Guys in the boat say, come on, you got to get into this boat quick. The water's rising. You're not going to last long. The guy says, that's okay. I'm waiting for the Lord to deliver me. Now the, the water has got up to the roof and he's on top of the roof. And a helicopter comes by. And the People in the helicopter are saying, come in here into the helicopter quick. The water's rising. You don't want to drown in this. And the guy says, I'm waiting for the Lord to deliver me. Unfortunately, the guy dies and he winds up in heaven. He's before the Lord. And he says, Lord, I trusted you. I thought you were going to deliver me. Why didn't you? The Lord's response was, well, I sent you a SUV, a boat and a helicopter. What more do you want? (laughs) I know, kind of a funny thing, right? But as I close this tonight, I have something to ask of you. Are you someone who is willing enough and brave enough to to live for Jesus Christ? No matter what the cost, are you willing to be the one to stand up and say, I believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. I believe in in the creation account of how the earth came into existence. And I believe that marriage is to be between one man and one woman. Are you willing and brave enough to say those things, to live those things, to live what you believe? Are you willing enough and brave enough to be like Jack or the Kleins or Baronel and to stand up for your faith no matter what the cost? Is right now you facing something where Satan is trying to put in you a spirit of fear? He's telling you maybe that you have no value or worth to God. Don't try it. You'll, you'll, you'll fall flat on your face. I'm praying with everything I have that you will know how much God is greater and more powerful than any fear, doubt, or opposition that you might face. That he is with you always. That if you do what Nehemiah did and turn your fears over to the Lord, choose to act on what Christ is telling you to do and do it. Pray and move. Allow him complete control over your heart and life so that you will see 
that you truly do have value and worth in God's eyes. And most of all, to know that if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're a child of the King. Remember that. Don't be afraid to live like it and act like it. Don't be afraid to boldly proclaim that I am a child of the King. Please don't. Because I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, we are living in a world right now where good is being called evil and evil is being called good. What are you going to stand on? I also, most of all right now, I pray that if there's anyone out there, anyone who doesn't know Christ, who thinks that there are many paths or other ways to heaven, who can't say without a shadow of a doubt that if they were to die right now, they would be in heaven with the Lord. I pray that you make the choice today to accept Christ as your Savior. All you need to do is admit that you're a sinner, that you are lost in your sins, and without accepting the gift of his precious blood for your sins, that you are condemned to hell forever. The Bible says the wages, the penalty for sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the greatest news yet. Jesus died, shed his precious blood for your sins. He was hung on a rugged, nasty cross, murdered, buried in a tomb, and rose again three days later, proving that he has the power over sin and death. And right now he's making this gift available to you. All you've got to do is accept it. And I urge you to do that today. Please don't think you can earn your way to heaven because that's totally impossible. And for those that want to think that there's no such thing as God, you are so being deceived. Please choose to make that decision today. He doesn't care who you are, what your religion is, your skin color, or anything about you or your lifestyle. Just let him in your heart today. I have a link here. I, I invite you to click on that link and make that decision today. Click on that link and read it and ask Christ to come into your heart today, please. But I also, I want to reach out to my brothers and sisters who may be struggling with something, who may be facing some form of fear. Remember, God is not giving you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Remember that. Choose to cling to the Lord. Choose to be as Nehemiah. And, and, and choose to, if, if it take you know, choose to, to, to trust God, to take him at his word. I understand sometimes you want to ask God for a sign. That's very understandable. But the cool thing is, you know what? When Gideon ultimately saw the hand of the Lord and he was told that, that how much he was loved and, and, and how do I put this? That he was loved and honored by God. That God valued him. He acted on it and did what God wanted of him. And I pray that you'll do that today too. I've got to get going. I have a, you know, a whole bunch to take care of today. But I wish you all a really wonderful evening. And I pray that you will realize, I pray that you will truly realize that God is greater than any fear, doubt, or opposition that comes your way. Remember, you are a child of the king. You are a son and or daughter of the king, so don't be afraid to live like it. You guys have an awesome evening. Bye for now.